Greetings in that name that is above every name, and that is the name of Jesus. How blessed we are, how wonderful it is to be here tonight on this Wednesday evening, on this wonderful, what a wonderful day it is. And I don't know about you, but I am blessed to be a part of God's agenda for the day and oh, how blessed we are. And we are looking forward uh, to an interesting and exciting session tonight. Um, <clears throat> this will be our final se session. And then we will go back to our regular Bible school. Oh. Yeah, and then we will go back to our regular Bible class, but uh, but uh, Black history will not end in February. But we are we are celebrating Black excellence this month, and uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a couple of people uh, in a few moments, but. Uh, we had a blessed time on last week as we interviewed uh, two persons from our congregation, and we will have one from our congregation tonight, and then we will have another special guest. All right, uh, we are delighted to have with us tonight uh, Sister Brenda Mitchell. Welcome, Sister Brenda Mitchell. Welcome, uh, with, welcome. Sister Dion Hyatt, we welcome Brother Charles Farley. Welcome Sister Anita Green. Welcome Sister Laura Kennelly. Welcome, welcome Deacon Vaughn Davis. Welcome Deacon Charles Parker, all the way from Sylvania, Georgia. Welcome Sister Vicki Parker from Sylvania, Georgia. Delighted to have our Georgia connection tonight. Welcome Sister Kimberly T. Hand, our office manager. We're delighted to have you on board tonight. And welcome, Sister Mary L. Smith. You're on board tonight. Welcome, uh, Brother Aaron King Sr., all the way from, uh, amen, all the way from Delaware. We're delighted to have you on board. Welcome, Sister Dawn Beasley. Welcome, Trustee Debbie Scott. Debbie Glover Scalper, delighted to have you on board. Welcome, Sister Rosa Bedford, all the way from Sylvania, Georgia. Welcome, Sister Katura Green, amen, all the way from Newcastle, Delaware. We welcome Sister Nell Criswell, amen. He was one of our interviewees on last week, all the way from Glenside, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Sister Valerie Mann. We are delighted to have you on board. Welcome, Sister Teresa A. Powell, the other interview we had from last week, all the way from Media, Pennsylvania. We welcome Sister Eula Hampton Madison. We are del all the way from Lawton, Oklahoma. We are delighted to have you on board tonight. We are welcome Sister Sharon Euler, all the way from Amen. Ardmore, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Brother Russell Moore. Amen. He don't like folks to tell me he's all the way from. Hey, don't be telling folks where he's from. He's from Georgia. Delighted to have you on board, my brother. Amen. Welcome, Deacon Wilbur Moore, all the way from uh, Newcastle, Delaware. Welcome, Sister Kia Kennelly. Welcome, Sister Angela Davis. Welcome, Sister Talissa Carter, we are delighted to have you on board. Amen. We see our other panelists and interviewer. Amen. In the person of Sister Dion Hyatt, we are delighted to have you on board. And uh, you are going to, amen, help me with the questions tonight. Welcome, Sister Peggy Haley. Delighted to have you on board tonight. Amen. Amen. If you have any any questions for our interviewers tonight, interviewees tonight, you can put them in the comments section and uh, we will get your questions uh, out and get them answered. 
Welcome, Sister Laura Kennelly. Amen. How blessed we are. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. Bow with me for a moment of prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you now for this opportunity and for this privilege of sharing uh, in these sessions uh, during the month of February. We thank you for those persons who uh, shared with us and who are vulnerable and open enough for us to talk to them as we promote Black excellence. And so we thank you for another opportunity and for this privilege in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now I can reveal unto you uh, our first interviewer tonight, interviewee tonight, will be none other than uh, Sister Jamie Gautier. She's the third councilmatic district in Philadelphia, and that includes and involves Mantua, uh, the church uh, where the church is located and uh, she in her short time as being council person she's been very helpful uh, to this pastor and for our congregation and for the community and I see her everywhere she has a lot of energy and since we are promoting and lifting up black excellence this month I thought it would be appropriate if we would invite her in to share with us and uh, let her talk to us and uh, tell, us, tell us something, some things as by way of introduction, uh, Sister Gautier, I'm gonna call, should I call you Councilwoman? Amen. Councilwoman. You can call me councilwoman, you can call me Sister Gaudier, either. Amen, Sister Gaudier. <laughs> Amen. But she is the councilwoman in the third councilmatic district. And uh, we're going to let you get started. Uh, welcome, Brother Dwayne. You, you go, you're going to follow. Uh, Amen, Sister Gaudier. And, uh, and so we're going to have her introduce herself now and tell us a little bit about herself. And then we'll uh, ask us some questions. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm Council Member Jamie Gaudier. I represent Philadelphia's third district, which includes large parts of West and Southwest Philadelphia. Um, as um, Reverend Moore said, I'm new. I'm newer to council. Um, I just crossed a year in city council. Um, I have a background in urban planning. Um, I've spent most of my career working in nonprofit community and economic development. So I worked for a while um, helping to fund affordable housing projects across the city. Um, I led a small nonprofit that focuses on helping small businesses to start and grow. And I also led our local parks conservancy. So I feel like I've spent most of my career helping Philadelphians to build the communities they want to live in. And I thought that being a district council member was an amazing opportunity to accomplish that in, in an even better way. I'm also from King Sessing, um, which is in the third district. So it was an honor to represent the area where I'm from. <laughs> amen, amen. We are delighted to have you tonight and thank you for, thank you for coming and uh, availing, availing yourself. And uh, I know that you will, would, and uh, that's why I invited you because I've been at several meetings and community meetings and community gatherings and shootings and that kind of thing. And you always show up in your district. You, you are not a council person who stays in the office, but you are out there with the people. And I want you to know that we appreciate you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've almost, and just about answered my next question, because my next question was going to be, how did you get into politics and become a council person? Um, I, I can explain that more uh, in a fuller way. Um, I really think the drive to be in public service came from my father. Um, my father, Leon Williams, um, he's an attorney, but 
I feel like he's more of a community activist than he is an attorney. <laughs> and, you know, from the time I was little, I would see him um, defending, you know, Black activists in our city. Mm -hmm. um, I saw him advocate for um, the rights of, of Black people to have a high quality education in our city. My father ran for district attorney twice um, against Lynn Abraham as an independent candidate um, and was really pushing this very progressive idea of what the district attorney's office should do to help people stay out of, of prison. Um, and so I saw that, and I also wanted to build a career that was about helping people and serving people. And for me, that was becoming an urban planner and having this career where I could like help um, residents to shape their neighborhoods, right? Um, and I think district council members have an amazing opportunity because we have such um, involvement in land use and development decisions, we have a great opportunity to help residents to really shape um, their communities. And that's why it was important to me um, to move from the nonprofit sector into, into government and into this role specifically. Amen. Thank you so very much. And you just, you just shared something with me that I did not know. Yeah. I did not know that you was Leon Williams. Oh, you know my dad? Everybody knows well, my dad. So I should everybody knows your dad. You know, <laughs> he's been an activist for a long time. I think I was president of Black clergy in uh, 1995, 96 and 97. And he was always an advocate and champ champion the causes of Black people. Yep. And so uh, I thank you for that. Now I now I know you. That was in my blood. <laughs> Amen. So I'm I'm we're just blessed to have you tonight, uh, Dion. Hi, yourself. Councilwoman Jamie. Hi. This is Dion. I have a quick question for you. I was. It's very impressive, and it seems like you have been in public service even before you became a councilwoman. She has. And I read through a list of some of the things you were involved in, and I'm wondering, when you think back on everything that you've done to date, what would you think, what do you think is your greatest accomplishment for you? Yeah. Um, for me, I think it's been the, the opportunities that I've had to really um, help residents to have a voice in their community. So I'll, I'll go back to when I used to work for an organization called LISC or Local Initiative Support Corporation. Um, I had the opportunity to um, really build up or help build up community capacity in Mantua, right? There was a huge federal grant coming to Mantua and um, we wanted to make sure that residents had the opportunity to really have their voice reflected in what the community plan was gonna be. So we hired an on the ground organizer to like be in the community every day to make sure that residents were included in that process. Out of that came the Mantua Civic Association. So we helped to, um, to start the Mantua Civic Association. I got to participate in that. And to me, that's the most important part of my work. Um, neighborhoods in Philadelphia are changing. They're changing rapidly. They're changing in a way that people feel like they can't grasp or control. And so my strongest charge is to make sure that residents here have a voice and that our neighborhoods are developing in ways that are equitable. So I would say that's, that, is, that was one of the most meaningful things that I did outside of council. I have things in council that I've, I've been, I'm proud of too that have happened in this past year. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, my kids that, and my cats are like. That, that, <laughs> they, they provide. They provide a good background. Uh, that 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 helps me to understand now why you are so visible in the community and anything that happens in your district. Uh, you are, you always pops up and and uh, you're always there. Tell me something about how do you deal with your colleagues and how do they receive you in council when you're in City Hall and, uh, and working with those who don't necessarily look like you do and being young, Black, and articulate and 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 all of that talk to us about that how you deal with your colleagues and uh in in council 
Well, I've learned a lot this year, right? Um, I've learned a lot about um, coalition building and about um, relationships and counsel. Um, I think one of my toughest experiences was um, working with council members Brooks and Gim on the Emergency Housing Protection Act. So we were putting together, you know, what I think was a very ambitious legislation designed to protect renters and keep them in their homes um, during the pandemic, because we're now in this space where housing is healthcare. And if you lose your housing, um, you are much more susceptible to this disease. And so we put together this package of legislation that included an eviction moratorium. We waived late fees. We said that tenants had the right to get into long-term payment plans for back rent. Um, we even tried to do rent control during the pandemic. And it was a pretty contentious um, process because um, we were saying that tenants deserve to be protected and that protecting tenants is not only, you know, it's more than a private property issue, it's a public health issue because we're mm -hmm. all susceptible to getting this virus if people don't have secure housing. And we were up against a landlord lobby that was, you know, they were going at our colleagues and trying to get them over to their side. Um, and I would say that that experience taught me a lot about negotiation. Um, it taught me a lot about listening trying to find um, compromise um, on um, contentious legislative um, pro uh, issues. Um, but so overall, I would say that my colleagues have been um, welcoming, but you know, council members exist along a spectrum. Um, and I've had to learn to find places of agreement, um, especially on, you know, bold, bold sort of policy ideas. And I'm still finding my way through that. But overall, mm -hmm. it's been good. And I've definitely had the opportunity to build some strong allies, certainly with um, Council Members Gim and Brooks, and certainly with the rest of the freshmen for um, Council Member Gilmore Richardson, Council Member Thomas um, as well. I'm finding my way. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's always a blessing to have allies, and I think there were yeah. uh, there were four of you. Uh, uh, that's that's new council per, council persons. So that means that y'all have you know y'all have uh, some mutual ground and some mutual support with each other because you are you are freshman uh, council persons, and uh, and uh, since you from Philadelphia and. Uh, uh, your father been here for a long time. You know, you kind of know the way Philadelphia operates, and and particularly, and particularly when you are young and new. Mm -hmm. But but you bring a wealth of knowledge and and information uh, to the table, which we are very very proud of. Thank you so uh, much, Dion. I was just wondering, being new to being a councilwoman, I'm wondering how difficult is it to get things done? Um, it's it's a complicated place. Not only is council, you know, a very complicated place with a lot of relationships to um, manage and a lot of personalities to learn. Um, the administration is a complicated place. So learning how city agencies work, the, the, the people you need to contact to get stuff done, it is extremely, it's a lot. And nobody sort of, there's no real orientation that anybody can give you. And then, you know, for the four freshmen, um, we came in in January. And then by March, you know, 13th, I think that's when the city sort of formally closed down. So we've been operating in this virtual environment for a year. That's not the easiest way to build relationships mm. um, with people. So I, I would say it's been been pretty tough, but you know, I'm learning my my way through and you don't, you know, my constituents needed me to jump in. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's what I've been been trying to do. Oh thank you. <laughs> let, let, let me ask you a kind of different question. What is it that that anchors you and keep you, because I know it's when I have to deal with the city and uh, the different organizations, it's it's tough for me and I'm not on the inside, but you're on the inside and you've got to juggle a lot of balls. 
what is it that keeps you grounded and and solid and focused? Um, the, the work that I'm trying to do to help people. So um, as an example, last last year, 2020 was just, it was just such a tumultuous time. And there were so many crises at once um, that I think it would have been easy to just not have any focus, right? Because there's so many things that needed to, to be done. But I really tried my best to focus on the things that are that I knew were most meaningful um, and that would be most impactful for my constituents. Um, so I knew uh, housing was important in general in the city, but also during the pandemic. And so that's why I focus so much on um, housing legislation and in particular affordable housing legislation. Um, Last year, there was so much civil unrest. And so I felt a desire to be in the community, helping my constituents to have these conversations about policing in their community and about how we should be reimagining um, public safety in a way that really benefits, particularly black communities. Um, gun violence is something that is like, um, it's, it's uh, disproportionately impacting the third district. So it has to be my top priority, making sure that my communities get the resources and the attention mm -hmm. that we need as, as, um, as these shootings happen on a daily basis. Um, that has to be my, my focus right now. Um, and so the thing that keeps me focused is the I know that I can have an impact on um, people in a positive way um, if I focus on the things that will be the most meaningful for them. And so I try to just always keep my mind on that. Amen. Amen. Do we have any questions in the chat? We do. We have um, one question from Dr. Powell. She okay. would like to you to tell us about a time that you were unsuccessful at accomplishing something you wanted and explain how you recovered from it. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, okay. So I told you about, um, wait, where is this being broadcast on Facebook? <laughs> yes. yes. Out what I want to, what I want to talk about. Um, okay. So I told you guys but, about but how. Feel, feel free not to go in a direction if <laughs> you don't feel comfortable doing that. It's something I've talked about publicly anyway. So I told you guys about how I worked with the other council members on that housing legislation, right? Um, that was a big win for us. Um, and it was a big win for me in my first session. So in my second session, um, we teamed up to extend those protections to renters, but um, there became this huge um, debate around the eviction moratorium around if we were going to have like a broad moratorium that would just, you know, protect everybody, or if we were going to have a more narrow moratorium that would only protect people that were like harmed by COVID in some way, right? And the bulk of my committee wanted to have that more narrow um, legislation. Also, I'm the chair of the committee. I'm the chair of the housing committee. Um, and oh, yeah. I wanted, I, I wanted them to vote on, on, you know, the broader legislation and to vote it up or down. And they basically, um, refused to. <laughs> and so it was a lesson for me about how far I can push things if people are not in agreement. And I think by far, um, council members do not want to have those public, um, they don't, do not want to have public disagreements. They do not want to have disagreements on the floor. They want to be able to negotiate and compromise and then to come to, you know, some type of um, conclusion publicly that shows that we're aligned. Um, and as a new committee chair, I don't think I understood that as, as well. Um, so it didn't, it was, um, you know, it wasn't fun. It was, that was not fun at all. It was stressful. It was, it was on um, the job training, huh? It was, it was very on the job training. <laughs> so how Thank did, you. How, but a so, learning so, lesson, for sure. Let me, let me just follow up with that. How did you get to be chair being a freshman councilwoman? 
So every council member gets to chair a committee. Oh, okay, it's just okay. about which committee you're going to get to chair. So generally, the more senior council members get to chair the most powerful committees, like appropriations, right? Um, which which deals with you know what money is going to get allocated to what. That's a powerful position. Like no freshman is getting that that position. Um, but I um, you know. I care so much about housing and I want to have a strong, you know, legislative um, body of work in that area. So the fact that I, I was able to get that was really meaningful to me. Um, and, um, and it's allowing- Uh Yeah, it's allowing me to build out my agenda. But every, every council member gets to hear something. Amen. Um, is it anything else that you want our young people to know that's going to inspire them and help them to think that they can uh, become and do what you are doing that you want to share with us in your closing remarks? Sure, just that... Um... I've always, as I thought about my career and what I wanted to do and where I wanted to have an impact, I've always had a vision for myself. Like, so I had a vision for myself in my head and I tried to curate the experiences that I thought would get me to that vision. So, um, so for example, I've known that I wanted to be in this council seat for at least the last decade. And so, you know, I'm from wow. the district. I moved back to the district as an adult. I started putting in place the type of experiences that I thought would get me there. Mm. I became the president of my neighborhood civic association. Um, I volunteered, you know, in, at my kid's school, which was in the district. Um, I sat on the nonprofit boards that I thought would help me make the community connections. And I also became comfortable with taking calculated risk, right? Most people are so scared of risk that they're going to tell you, oh, don't do that. You're crazy. You know what I mean? Um, but, you know, I left LISC, for example, to lead a very, you know, small, not wealthy nonprofit. That was a risk. Mm -hmm. I left there to lead the Fairmont Park Conservancy. I left there to jump in the council race. And people told me I was absolutely crazy. But I had made the calculated risk that the winds mm. were changing in Philadelphia, that people wanted new leadership, and that 2019 was my time, and I had laid the groundwork. Um, and so, and, and I also kn knew that I would regret it too much if I didn't do it. And so I did it. And so curate the experiences that you want. And if you're confident that you've built your, your resume up, your skill up, your experiences up, don't listen to all the people who tell you that you're crazy and you can't do the things wow. you want to do. <laughs> now, uh, where did you go and uh, when you left the neighborhood and then moved back into the neighborhood? Um, I lived. I got married. Um, I lived in Northeast Philly for a while because he was from that area. Um, I I can't wait to get back to West Philly because I'm a I'm a West South Philly girl, <laughs> and so um, and and also you know as a child when we left the district. You know, my parents, we moved to Winfield. So my parents still live in Winfield. Mm -hmm. um, so just another part of, of, of West Philly. But yeah, as an adult, I lived for a little bit in Northeast Philly. And then I came back here um, to the district to raise my kids. And I think you said something that was very important. You knew that you wanted that seat a decade ago. Yeah. And, and you made steps in that direction and put things in place because sometimes as young people we get impatient and uh we think we can get it just because i want it but you put the work in and when you put the work in and did the work you accomplished your goal and so yeah. uh i i am i i am impressed uh, uh by that statement and and how you have accomplished what you set out to do and uh you know our young people need to know that that it comes through hard and consistent work. And you were very consistent in what you did and you accomplished your goal. And I am, I am proud of you and delighted to have you share with us today. We have any other questions 
uh, we have uh, Council. one more question for the councilwoman. Okay. We have a question from Cynthia Allen. She would like to know what steps can we take to advocate? She wants to know what steps we can take to advocate for our real estate taxes to be reduced. And she said the church is in the Mill Creek neighborhood. For the, for the church's real estate taxes? Yes, to be reduced. Oh, they should reach out to me. Um, <laughs> they should reach, reach out to me and let's, let's talk about that and let me see you know, what I can connect them to in terms of city programs and um, let's talk about her specific situation. And so my email address is Jamie, J-A-M-I-E dot Gaudier, G-A-U-T-H-I-E-R at scylla.gov. Um, and you can reach us by phone at 215-686. 0460. But I, I, I think the best way is to email me and kind of spell out the situation. I'll get my staff working on that right away. And there was one other question, the last question from Chanel. She, she said you mentioned addressing gun violence in the third district as a top priority. Yeah. And she wants to know, are there any programs or task force that are already established that's open to the public or the community members so that they can give their time and assist? Um, I don't know about what we have available in terms of volunteer programs. I mean, most of the, the a lot of the city's work to address gun violence runs out of the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, so there, um, they have a lot of programs like um, violence interrupters that go out in the neighborhood and try to talk to young people and facilitate neighborhood conflicts that could turn into gun violence, for example. They also are operating um, an initiative called the group, uh, group Violence Intervention that's trying to cut down violence between street groups. Um, I'm not sure of opportunities to volunteer with them, but you can go to the city's website um, to look up the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, I know there's a program that's been good called Man Up, Man Up PHL. Um, they've been doing work to mentor young people um, out in our community that may be at risk of getting involved with gun violence. And I think they work through um, volunteers. Um, you could also look for opportunities to um, volunteer maybe with the anti-violence partnership. Um, and so those are just a few um, organizations and the city agency through which a lot of this work kind of kind of runs through. For my part, I've been pushing for um, Mayor Kenny to uh, to declare a citywide emergency as it relates to, yes. to violence and to direct more resources into our neighborhoods for violence prevention um, and, and intervention. Oh, thank you. Hey, Amen. Thank you, Councilwoman. We certainly appreciate you and thank you for agreeing to come on and share with our congregation and and really folk from across the country and and around the world. And so we were, we are delighted to have you tonight. And, you so and, 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 and you're welcome to stay with us for the next half. And uh, we're going to welcome at this time, uh, he's a deacon at Second Mount Zion, Deacon Dwayne Brooks. And so uh, Deacon Brooks, he, uh, he's going to share with us now uh, his introductory remarks and tell us something about himself. Dean Dwayne Brooks. Uh, thank, thank you, Pastor. Um, I'm Dwayne Brooks. Um, I am uh, Director of Operations for Insomnia Cookies. I'm also the Vice Chair of the Deacon Board at Second Mount Zion. Uh, I was born in West Philly. I was born in Philadelphia, raised on 38th and Aspen. Um, so Aspen Street will always be my home. Uh, I studied uh, business and culinary and got into the restaurant business and I've been rolling ever since. Um, I've had a pretty good good career in the restaurant business and in food. Uh, a lot of people ask me what I do and it, I really I don't really deal with food. I deal with people and I deal with the people and how they deal with food. So uh, my job is to coach them up to, to do better uh, in in these food establishments. So that's that's really what my focus is. Amen. Uh, 
Deacon Brooks, where did you uh, tell us something about your schooling and where did you go to school at? So I went to the Art Institute of Atlanta. Uh, I started out in the Art Institute of Philadelphia and I, I went to Atlanta. Uh, probably the best move I ever made in my life was to, to Of course, to that's Georgia. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. That, that was an eye-opening experience for myself coming from 38th and Aspen uh, to be in Georgia by myself, um, where I, I think I, I learned a lot and I was able to grow there. And uh, when I left Atlanta, uh, I moved back to Philly and uh, I started studying business at CCP. And uh, my background is in really business management and business administration. Uh, I settled for a... Uh, business management certificate uh that way i can get a higher paying job and then i moved up in my career amen amen thank you thank you thank you so very much um uh, dion i'll let you start off okay i'm gonna start off with the question that dr powell asked um the councilwoman she wanted to ask you the same as well and that was um, tell us about a time that you were unsuccessful at accomplishing something you wanted and explain how you recovered. Yes. So um, when I first moved back to Philadelphia, uh, I wanted to open up a business, a food truck. And uh, I knew I wanted to do it then. And um, after a while of uh, really pounding the pavement and trying to get the money together and, and et cetera, et cetera. I, I kind of learned that I needed more education on what I was doing. So really how I recovered from it is I learned more about the business. And as I learned more about the business, I learned an easier way to make money in the business without diving in face first, uh, without any knowledge. Very good. And so what's your current position now? I am the director of operations for uh, the capital region. So I control uh, DC and Maryland. Uh, you control DC and Maryland. Yeah. Well, DC. Uh, so you should, you should have stopped that riot the other week. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't take cookies. They, they, would, they wouldn't take cookies. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, Brother Dwayne Brooks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they, they wouldn't take cookies, but uh, uh, yeah, I control DC and Maryland. Um, I have eight stores. I actually just got off a meeting a, a few minutes ago. I got approved for a ninth store that we're going to open in Arlington, Virginia in the next six months. And uh, my goal is 12 stores with the company uh, over the next two years. Amen. Amen. We're, amen. That's, that's, that's very good. Uh, but I also hear that that does not come without hard work and consistency. And uh, um, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, it takes dedication. I mean, with, as with anything, you know, as we learn in life, that it definitely takes dedication. Um, I've always been a person that's been job driven. Uh, if anyone knows me, if I did anything, regardless of what I was doing, I managed to always stay in the mix of, of work and, and dedicate a lot of time, you know, to work. And um, as I as I walk through my career, I've learned what to focus on and what not to focus on. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of commitment. It's a 60 to 70 hour work week, um, but it's not as strenuous as people think it is. Whereas, you know, previously restaurant work is on your feet nonstop. You know, I was with Chili's. I was with Chili's for four and a half years. And um, that work was really grinding. But then this work is now more only dealing with people. And I, I absolutely love it because uh, I deal with my people for this position. Um, and, you know, my, my managers are all, they remind me of myself in my 20s and, and, and uh, early 30s because they all have ambition and uh, they're all coming from a place uh, similar to mine in, in Baltimore and, and in D.C. So 
let's see, Debbie Glover wants to know, tell us about a time when you had to enforce a policy you did not agree with and how did you work through it? Um, you know, I've actually been criticized a lot about that in my career um, because I, I came up as a manager that was like an enforcer. I, I tell employees all the time and I tell managers all the, uh, or uh, my current managers all the time that I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to make the decision. Like it's not my job to make the rule, but I'm the person they're probably going to send to pull the trigger. So I'm, I'm, I'm the one that they're going to, that they're going to um, uh, make it happen. Uh, although, you know, it might not, I might not agree with it or, you know, it might not be my decision. Now, as far as policies, I'm a pretty black and white person, which means, it, you know, if it's in the handbooks, that's the policy. If it's not, it's not. Now I have coached people into ways to get around some policies and definitely try to help people because, you know, our, our, our young people, are, um, they, we struggle with employment and I deal with it every day. You know, they, mm -hmm. they don't know how to keep a job or they don't know how to talk in a meeting or they don't know how to handle their issue when they're having a problem on the job. And a lot of times, you know, in restaurant management and in management, they want you to just control the situation. So my, my, my job is just to control the person um, and basically to get them to do what the policy is or or what it it it's entailed uh for that person to do now if it's something that is black and white then it's black and white for example if a person you know is you know stealing or or doing something that is unethical th there's no no hiding from that but then you know there's also the idea that a lot of our young people they're just not educated in how to deal with jobs so policies can be you know, skewed in that way. Oh yeah, when you are a manager, I mean, when you are a director, you know how to you know how to flex the policies. Uh, have you experienced racial tension on your job? And if so, how did how did you how did you handle that? Um. Yeah, believe it or not, no. I, I actually experienced a lot of racial tension on my job. Um, I am in a pool of, we have uh, 27 directors, four of them are black, two black males, two black females. When I became a director, there was only two black directors, myself and one, and one young lady, and that was it. Um, the rest of pretty much my entire peer panel um, is all, believe it or not, is, is uh, they come from like the suburbs, they come from rural areas and a lot of them, none of them look like me. Mm -hmm. um, none of them understand. One of the reasons why I was offered the capital region was because of, and I'll tell this story, an incident that happened um, where I was the director of Philadelphia region and there was definitely some tension between myself and the manager of Philadelphia because, and one of the big fights was about delivering to 38th and Aspen. But what they did not know is I'm actually from 38th and Aspen. And, uh, you know, th there, there was a lot of words said that I didn't agree with. Um, and I've, I've learned, one, to never bite your tongue when it comes to expressing how you really feel about those issues, uh, but to hold them accountable. So, you know, dealing with racial tension is just part of, part of the job. The, the goal is to get more of our people, you know, um, in those positions to where the tension isn't so thick. Or is it so heavy? Amen. Mr. Dion? I was thinking back to something the councilwoman said about will, being willing to take a risk. And then mm -hmm. your conversation earlier when you talked about going down to Atlanta, coming back up here to start a food truck. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice do you have for uh, some of our young youth now are trying to you know, do their entrepreneurial thing? What kind of advice do you have for them as far as being a risk taker and when to say, okay, I need to do something else or I need to do this before I can actually move to where I want to be? Uh, the, the, the best advice that I can give them is to always follow your heart, always follow your dream. Um, and definitely always, you know, invest in yourself and believe in yourself. Uh, a lot of times people get that 
confused when we say invest in yourself. Invest in yourself doesn't mean just quit your job and go in. Invest in yourself might be get the education that you need. Uh-huh. Invest in yourself might be, you know, um, uh, pay attention to the financials. Um, or it might just be take advice, seek a mentor, um, seek someone that uh, is doing what you're doing. And believe it or not, how I got with Insomnia Cookies was because I was going to run their food truck on, 38, on 33rd Street. And that's how I got with the company. And so, you know, that if you take that risk, um, and you have to take risks. They have to be calculated, like Councilwoman said, and they have to be, uh, there's a lot of dedication that comes along with it. So you have to be dedicated to that risk. I mean, and if you fail, the, the, the worst thing you can do is, is not try. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dwayne. Dion, is there any questions in the chat box for Brother Dwayne? Uh, no, none yet. I have one. Okay. Uh, is there something Teresa Powell wants to know? Is there something that you like us to know about you that we did not ask? Um, I, I, off the top of my head, no. I mean, if I could say anything about me that, you know, that, that wasn't talked about was, you know, the fact that I, you know, I did grow up on Aspen Street and that, you know, I, I am, my one of my biggest faults is I am dedicated to Nantua. You know, I, I was, a, I'm an Aspen Street kid. And um, I think that, uh, in listening to the councilwoman talk, I would say that, you know, hearing her talk about like gun violence, you know, I was a victim of gun violence on Aspen Street. You know, a lot of people don't know that. So uh, like all those things are, are, are things that make you who you are, but they don't define you, you know, uh, mm-hmm. they, don't, they don't define everything about you because the people that I work with don't know that I come from Aspen Street. They would think, a lot of them think I grew up in the suburbs. They think that, you know, I have uh, all types of extraneous education, and I, I really don't, you know, um, but I'm proud of who I am. Amen. Amen. I Thank love you. that. I love that. <laughs> Another <laughs> Philadelphia. Three Another. boys. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Deacon Brooks, for coming and sharing with us, and we are, we were delighted to have you on board, and 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 our goal this month was to celebrate black excellence and we're, we're not taken away from uh, the iconic blacks that we see uh, on the TV that we read about, but we wanted to highlight persons that we touch on a daily basis. And uh, you have helped us to reach our goal because we are lifting uh, you up and other Blacks who's been successful and in position uh, uh, to help others and to, and to lift others. And, and we are very proud of you and, uh, and very proud of the fact that you are not afraid to say, I am from Mantua. I am from 38th and Aspen. And so we're, we're just blessed to have you on board tonight. Amen. Sister Dion, is there any other questions that we need for Deacon Brooks? No. Amen. No Amen. questions. Amen. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Deacon Green, Deacon Green <laughs> wants to know, how come your cookies are so expensive? <laughs> Eight dollar cookies. <laughs> oh, is, is that your answer? <laughs> that, that's that, that's how that's how we we managed to grow. Oh, that's how you managed to grow, yes. and uh, that that pays his salary and uh, yes. and, and and adds to his retirement. Amen. Correct. 
Amen. Thank you so very much. Thank you for sharing. We want to thank all of those who shared with us uh, uh, these last two weeks. Next week, we'll be back at our Bible study. We'll be uh, looking at the uh, second chapter of the book of Acts, the history of the church, the acts of the Holy Spirit, uh, the acts of Jesus Christ through his apostles. And so we will be back on schedule on the uh, on the next week, but we were, we've been blessed this week. Thank you, Dion, for being my co-host and, and uh, sharing with me and helping me to facilitate these last two weeks. Thank and you, so, Pastor. And so at this time, uh, Reverend Palmer is going to, uh, he's going to pray for us. And since he's been sitting there quiet and he's been uh, chopping at the bits, he's going He's going to pray for our answered prayers, our prayer requests, and our unspoken prayers, and then he'll close us out. Reverend Palmer. Eternal and gracious God, our Father, we bless your name and thank you, God. We thank you, first of all, for those participants who thought it good to come and share with us their history and their experiences and their desires, God. And one thing that seemed to be a continuous thread was to be consistent. Yes, sir. Pursue your heart's dream. So, Father, we just thank you even now for examples that we can follow. Examples not only that we can follow, but that we can even touch and speak to and talk to. Thank you, Father God, for that. Thank you for the heart of our pastor who thought it not robbery to share these things with us and to keep us ever mindful that Black history is American history. It is world history. And so we thank you for who we are. And we pray now, Father, that every person that came and shared with us would be blessed by knowing you, would have a relationship with you, and would trust in you as we do. We thank you even now for all those whose prayers have been answered, for you are a prayer answering God. Thank you for the times that you said yes, and the times that you said no, and the times that you said wait. For you're the God who knows the beginning, middle, and the end. And Father, we thank you even now for all the prayer requests, those persons who have things upon their heart that they desire from you. Yes, sir. You said, be anxious for nothing, but through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for unspoken prayer. For there yeah. are times, God, when it is only you who we yeah. can only you who we can speak to. But we know you hear us and we know you respond. So even now, Father, we close out at this hour knowing that we have a loving Father that watches over us, that keeps us, and makes provision for us. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray, do say amen and amen. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his glory with exceeding great joy to the one wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forevermore. And every child of God did say amen. Amen, amen, and amen. I thought it was another good session. Yeah, Amen. excellent. Excellent stuff, man. That was good stuff.